The call of Christ upon each of our lives is to participate in acts of ministry that consciously work to relieve the suffering of the world. When I say the suffering of the world, I don't mean some hazy general concept. I refer specifically to the condition of those who are overlooked and ignored. This way of living requires bravery in unusual amounts, but I am sure that you already possess it. Relieving suffering can take many forms. It doesn't have to look like any one thing, but it needs to be something. It can't just be nothing. And it can't only exist just to make us feel better about ourselves. It begins with discerning carefully, looking hard to answer some important questions. Who do I see that is in pain, and from what, and why, and what can I do? Looking means inquisitively seeing, and seeing requires an attitude of receptivity, where we are ready to see things as they really are and not through our own overlay. Being inquisitive means learning, it means change, it means asking questions and not being able to assume that we're right about something. This is precisely an active form of prayer. It's thy will be done, not mine. We never know how or when or by what means God will choose to speak. So we try to stay open consistently to how the Holy Spirit is stirring us to action. Stay open long enough to the pain of the world and you will find empathy for the pain of the world. You'll find yourself in solidarity for the person or the group that's suffering. That's an important moment. Don't run too far out ahead of it when it happens. Empathy provokes us to look at problems long enough to really understand them. And finally, being able to say, you know what? I've seen the person. I've seen the pain. I get what's causing it. And now I'm prepared to go and do something about it. So with sufficient information, conviction, and prayer, we reach that stable place where we find that we cannot stall any longer and that it's now time to act. We may have to swallow hard, realizing that we're about to do something that we've not sufficiently imagined or tried before or that we feel unprepared for. But remember, as John Shedd wrote, that a ship in harbor might be safe, but that is not what ships are built for. So get the boat in the water, and you won't know until you try. Try and probably fail. But try anyway. Try a lot. Yoda was wrong. Yoda said there is no try. Baloney, all of life is try. All of the spiritual journey is try, try, try. Keep trying, keep failing, keep moving, keep iterating, keep coming back. This side of heaven Relieving the suffering of the world is not something we'll ever get to check off on our list as being completely done. Sometimes it's just another frustrating step in an endless process, but at other times it's more fraught than that. It's a particularly big and bold step along the way. Scary, 
even. You might have to apply for a job that is different from what we've known. We may have to go to school for a while to learn something more to be able to do this. We might have to move across the country to make something happen. But if you, if you don't take that step, if you stay in place and if fear consistently wins out, then who will come forward and relieve the suffering you have already witnessed, that you seem to have been tailor-made to jump in and address? And who will come and say all those prayers you've already said, do all that discernment, gather all that information, and finally commit to action? Relieving the suffering of the world takes audacity and daring. And for advice on bravery, I advise a helping of Paul Newman, not the salad dressing, the actor. Can you believe we live in a time in which when we say Paul Newman, we have to delineate if we mean something that goes on food or well, in the 1994 film, Nobody's Fool, Paul Newman plays Sully. Sully is a man who's prone to messing up. He can't do much of anything right. He's self-involved. His life is a mess. And in one scene, he accidentally leaves his grandson, Will, behind for a moment. And when he realizes his error, goes back to get him, but it's a little late, and his apologies just don't cut it. The kid got scared, and you can't just undo that. But Sully has a moment of insight after he's had a while to think about it. So he sits down next to Will, and he says, first of all, he says, uh, he apologizes. And then he says, you were pretty scared, weren't you? Uh-huh. So he says, you know what I used to do when I was your age and I got scared? I'd try to be brave for exactly a minute. And the next time I'd try to be brave for two minutes. Will says, what were you scared of? So he says, I don't remember, but hey, when you get to be my age, you won't remember either. Then he holds up a stopwatch. He says, here, you can time yourself with this. Big hand will go around once, that'll be a minute. Goes around again, that'll be two minutes. Then you can tell how long you've been brave. Here, and he hands him the watch. Thank you, the grandson says. You're welcome. Later on, this gets put to the test because Will has to do a hard thing. And Sully's nearby and Sully says, still have that stopwatch. So Will pulls out the watch and he starts the second hand and he goes to do the hard task. And Sully knows that this time he will not look away. He won't get busy and forget his charge. And this speaks to what we need to have happening around us once we have committed to relieve suffering. After insight and discernment and prayer and bravery, the next thing we need is support in the form of other people. We need coaches, mentors, elders. We need the infrastructure that is the made up of the wise ones who have also heard the cry of suffering and answered it in their own way and time with God's help. A community that does not have active eldering and mentoring happening probably not going to survive to create a new generation of itself. And so we need insight. We need strategy. 
We need backers who believe in us. We need people who are committed to us and to the larger project over the long haul who aren't going to let the line slack, take their hands off our backs, or abdicate responsibility. We need people who see the potential in us and who understand what's at risk for the world if we don't act. In fact, time does not permit us to name all that we need if we are to consciously relieve the suffering of the world. Let me just file a few more things quickly by title. After looking and discerning and commitment and action and bravery and mentors, we still need a warm and accepting community to keep us honest and engaged. We need formation to be fully equipped in serving God's mission. We need to read scripture often enough that eventually it starts to read itself in us. We need administrative and logistical and budgetary minds that help to stabilize our service. We need partners out beyond these walls who approach big questions with similar values. And we need to love ourselves and each other enough so that when those little successes come, we can stop and enjoy the results of our labor. It sounds like quite a list. But let me give you one more theological proposition. What we need is here. Everything you need to consciously relieve the suffering of the world is already here. It's in you, in us, in this place, in its ministries, it's in these words and directives of Jesus. It may not exist yet in something you can rest your hand on, but that's a question of holy imagination and conversation and discernment and sweat and time. Thanks be to God. Everything we need is already here. Amen.